Good afternoon, everyone. This is TransConnect, and we are in December 2023. Today, we'll be talking about a very important topic that is platelet function test over theorized and underutilized. Platelet function tests are the tests that we encounter not very often, but still we need to know it because, firstly, it is an exam question, and secondly, uh, there are many a times when clinicians are going to ask us why our platelet counts are not uh, increasing or the platelet desired effect is not coming. So may, uh, you need to answer that. And for that, you need to know what platelet function tests are employed, when they should be employed, and what are the results and what are the tracers associated with it. So my talk will essentially cover the platelet structure, the primary hemostasis, platelet disorder classification, approach in a bleeding case, and where platelet function test uh, happen to be there in this approach, thrombocytopenia, platelet function test, what are the platelet function tests, and why they are generally present in theory, and what we can do to, you know, over uh, aptly utilize. So what are platelets? Platelets, uh, normal value, we all know it's 1.5 to 4.5 lakhs. Uh, they are the small non-nucleated cells with fine granules derived from fragmentation of megakaryocytes. So if you can see, they are uh, derived from a megakaryocyte and basically they are it's like a pincing effect where they are removed from the megakaryocyte as a platelet. These are essential for normal hemostasis. They are a principal cell mediator and uh, lifespan around 9 days with a half-life of 8 to 12 days. They are produced in bone marrow by fragmentation of cytoplasm, like I said, pincing effect. And they are having two primary growth factors like thrombopoietin and stem cell factor. So coming to the primary hemostasis, this can be explained in this pictorial representation. There are three main uh, um, factors here. If you see, first is the platelet addition. So whenever there is a primary hemostatic plug to be formed, the first happens is a platelet addition. And this uh, happens when there is a subendothelial collagen that is exposed due to some injury or something. And what happens is then the von Willebrand factor, which is present here, combines with the platelet through a receptor called as glycoprotein 1B. So, and we all know what is the deficiency of glycoprotein 1B or mutation in glycoprotein 1B can cause. It can cause a, a, a syndrome known as bernard solier syndrome. So, they can, these platelets are attached to this subendothelial collagen through von Willebrand factor, or they can also combine directly to the collagen through the glycoprotein 6, but more so strong effect is through the glycoprotein 1B, von Willebrand factor addition, and this process causes platelet addition. Now what platelet addition does essentially is it leads to change in the shape and also it paves the way for platelet activation wherein there are some kind of these agonists or sometimes these uh, factors that are released which are like ADP, from boxin A2 from the cyclooxygenase pathway or arachidonic acid pathway. And what it does is ADP is like a whistleblower along with the thromboxin A2, which causes basically platelet to come, uh, more platelets to come forward. And it also causes activation of P2Y12 and P2Y1 receptors, which essentially is a receptor which causes activation of glycoprotein 2B3A, which is present for platelet aggregation. So what platelet aggregation happens after that is when this glycoprotein 2B3A receptor, which is activated through this ADP, which is produced after platelet activation. And what it does essentially is it brings fibrinogen there and fibrinogen attached to this glycoprotein 2B3A receptors and it causes platelet plug formation. Now, once platelet plug is formed, after the platelet provide the phospholipid surface for the secondary hemostasis, which we are not going to discuss today. So basically platelet, if you remember, there are uh, alpha and uh, dense granules. So uh, basically these granules are released and one of them is uh, 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 PDGF and other uh, granules are released and this essentially causes the platelet aggregation. So there are three main mechanisms, platelet addition, platelet activation and there you have release or platelet secretion and then the platelet aggregation. So whenever we discuss platelet disorders, we should remember there can be quantitative defect or qualitative defect. Qualitative defect can be thrombosthenias like Glanzmann thrombosthenia and other platelet function defects. And quantitative would be thrombocytopenia when there is decrease in the platelet count and thrombocytosis when it, there is increase in platelet count. 
so when we do the classification of thrombocytopenia it essentially involves two main two main factors one is the pseudo thrombocytopenia and the other is the true thrombocytopenia pseudo thrombocytopenia essentially means that platelet count is normal but when you are trying to you know decipher what's the platelet count it comes low it can be due to platelet satellitism giant platelets or platelet clumping so you need to rule that out you need to change the change the uh, the anticoagulant in which you are taking sometimes you need to do a peripheral smear and see exactly what the platelet count is otherwise if you see the real thrombocytopenia or the true thrombocytopenia it could be because of three causes it could be decreased platelet production increased platelet destruction and abnormal platelet distribution so this is a topic for a different day today we are talking about platelet function disorders so how does platelet function disorder happen it can be all the three mechanism which i just spoke about in primary hemostasis it could be an addition defect it could be an aggregation defect it could be a granule release defect so whenever there is an addition defect it could be bernard solier or von willebrand disease i've already discussed it is a when whenever addition happens you have to have one b9 receptor along with von willebrand disease which comes in and attaches the platelet so it can be inherited when it is bernard solier or von willebrand disease it can be acquired when it is uremia or acquired von willebrand disease Similarly, aggregation involves fibrinogen and factor 2b3a. So, whenever there is a defect in factor 2b3a, it is called a Glanzmann thrombosthenia. And when itself the fibrinogen is less or there is afibrinogenemia, it can be an inherited disorder due to aggregation defect. Then we can have an acquired defect due to the receptors that are involved in aggregation, like P2Y212 in inhibitors or glycoprotein. Uh, GPI inhibitors and dysproteinemia. So there are some drugs which are acquired defects in aggregation. Similarly, we may have a granule release defect or uh, some acquired defect, and very commonly, uh, which can occur as a platelet function defect, is a when we use the aspirin. So that can cause a platelet function defect, an acquired platelet function defect. In fact, uh, asking the history of aspirin or asking the history of NSAIDs is very important whenever you are trying to decipher or initial evaluation for any platelet that is the rbc wbc and platelet all are affected then you go for a bone marrow aspiration or a biopsy to rule out what are the other causes of pancytopenia so once you have established it, it is an isolated thrombocytopenia you go for a peripheral smear and platelet count so that will give you the clue to the diagnosis so smear is very important because it will give you a both abnormal even if it is a normal you can always predict other diseases like itp but when it is abnormal you look for other rbc abnormalities like spherocytes which can happen in any hypersplenism schistocytes which are a part of all the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and uh, thrombotic microangiopathic uh, anemia and macrocytes if they are there it points to a megaloblastic anemia you can may have a leukoerythroblastic uh, reaction and sometimes you may have blast or pancytopenia so now sometimes what you may also see is that everything is normal your but your platelet count also is not somewhat decreased and you may have other abnormalities in the platelet itself you may have a micro thrombocytopenia wherein the platelet size is very very small or which can happen in viscotyledrous syndrome you can have a macro thrombocytopenia which may happen in various diseases uh, including uh, bernard solier syndrome you may have gray platelets where the granules are gray so this may this may be a clue to a functional defect now whenever you have a bleeding disorder this is the initial evaluation which all of us should do before we you know even send out the test or the initial screening test so clinical history is the most important screening test if you may call it as a screening te if a test itself so you should have a history of bleeding if there is any bleeding history in the family or anybody in the family who is having the same kind of problem you can you may have a tool for it a bleeding assessment tool is a real handy thing to you know have it in these conditions and all the other systems involved in uh, plus the hematology so you have to even look at the sepsis profile renal profile lfts the kidney function test this will give you a clue to as a systemic approach as to what is the problem in this bleeding along with bleeding there can be many other disorders which may also cause some kind of a thrombocytopenia now drug history is very important and you need to even ask about over the counter drugs that the patient is taking it may be an aspirin a small uh, a medicine which i think a lot of people you know consume it can be an nsaids so all of that is very important because your drug history is going to point to you whether the platelets are functioning properly or not at times now platelet count 
and blood flame. So many a times people would not go through that blood flame part, but platelet count and blood flame are absolutely, absolutely necessary whenever you have a bleeding disorder, along with the uh, secondary hemostatic tests like PT, APTT, plus minus uh, thrombin time and fibrinogen, depending upon the clinical evaluation. So all of this will point towards a basic test like platelet count, blood film, PT, APTT, thrombin time and fibrinogen is a plus minus. Another very important test that has gained importance nowadays is the mean platelet volume, which can be very useful when investigating a, a possible bleeding disorder. Now, MPV or mean platelet volume can be elevated in uh, wherever there is an increased platelet production and in some inherited platelet disorders. Similarly, reduced MPV can be seen in conditions where platelet production is decreased, like in aplastic anemia or a syndrome like Viscuit Eldridge syndrome. So, the point I'm trying to make is you do not go for any screening test without taking a proper history, constructing a pedigree, and examining the patient properly. So once, once we have done that initial evaluation is 10, then we go for a platelet function test. And when do we go for a platelet function test is when there is an unexplained bleeding, which cannot be, you know, uh, which, which is with negative initial evaluation. So you have to see whether the bleeding has been, you know, you have a major cause or your initial evaluation is not pointing towards anything. It could be a platelet function defect. Also, when you are taking a family history and if there is a positive family history, and one person in the family is already having a platelet function disorder, it could be a reason for the platelet function test uh, to be performed. Genetic test also can suggest a platelet function disorder. Now the coming to the choice of test. So there are lots of platelet function tests which are there, but the gold standard is the platelet agrigometry. And whenever available, this is the most useful test for patient in suspected platelet function disorder. Testing may be inaccurate. The problem with the uh, agrigometry is that testing may be inaccurate if the patient is taking an antiplatelet medication or the thrombo uh, patient has a platelet count less than 80,000 or that is thrombocytopenia. So in thrombocytopenia cases, unless proved otherwise, you have to know the platelet count first and then you go for a platelet agrigometry test. Sometimes there are other genetic tests which are not available or available in plenty like you may have a tag in your department or a raw time or a flow cytometry assay. So sometimes people may opt for a, 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 a specific assay. Anyhow, the bleeding test or the bleeding time is not a recommended test and it's become an obsolete thing now. So coming to what are the platelet function tests that are available, we have the bleeding time Then the gold uh, standard is the platelet aggregometry test, which can be light transmission platelet aggregation in PRP or we can have a whole blood impedance platelet aggregometry. We have a platelet function analyzer that is PFA 100 or 200, which is a point of care test along with TEG, which is also a point of care test, but now platelet thromboelastography and rotem have gained more importance. Why? Because now we have platelet aggregometry combined with the thromboelastography, and this is the new rotem or the new TEG that has come up. Of course, we have flow cytometry, which is specific for some specific diseases, and it is very helpful at times in distinguishing Bernard Solier syndrome from Glanzmann thrombosthenia. And also, when you're screening test for BSS or that is Bernard Solio syndrome or Glanzmann thrombosthenia is positive, then you to establish or to you know confirm the diagnosis, you go for a flow cytometry assay. Bleeding time is obsolete, but still just for the literature, I'm just going to tell you that we use the Duke's IV method. We have all done it in our uh, MBBS times and uh, we all know how cumbersome and how subjective it is. And the normal value for Duke's method is two to five minutes. Coming to the main uh, crux of the platelet function test, that is the light transmission platelet aggregation. It is a gold standard test. We have discussed that and it, how do we do that? We add some agonists. So agonists are the ones which are going to cause platelet aggregation. So what are those? ADP, thrombin, collagen, adrenaline, arachidonic acid and ristocetin. All of these can be used in combination or alone to establish a platelet function defect depending upon what you are suspecting. And what do you use in there? You can use a citrate whole blood or a PRP. So what is the principle of light transmission or aggregometry? It is very simple. Platelet aggregation testing measures the ability of various agonists, the agonists that I was talking to you about, to induce an in vitro activation and platelet to platelet activation. So when that happens is you need a 37 degree add in the cuvette. It is trying to simulate the body temperature and the cuvette actually sits between the light source. This is the light source and there's a light out. 
so there is a cuvette which has this so basically if there are platelets they are going to interfere there will be less absorbance but when you have an agonist that is added to it platelets are going to aggregate and obviously when they are stirred like this the light is going to pass through and they are going to absorb less light and so the transmission is increased this is the basic principle of optical platelet aggregometry what are the commonly used agonists the agonists are adp collagen ristocetin adrenaline arachidonic acid thrombin and they all of different tracers or tracers that are produced uh, according to one agonist may be different from another agonist and you can also alter the concentrations of various agonists and this is going to help you in actually evaluating which part of the platelet function that is the platelet adhesion aggregation or secretion is affected so this is a basic aggregation trace very simple this is how when uh, a trace should look like so what happens is when you add an agonist first of all there is a shape change so there are five changes that may happen so first is the shape change after an addition of uh, you can see that the agonist is added here and there is a change in the shape so what happens that is the first phase and this is this is happening why because there is a uh, change in the platelet shape and hence a drop in the baseline absorbance so this is the shape change here then you have the primary wave when the agonists like adp act after a while when there is a secretion there is release of nucleotide that is the third phase you can see that here and then you have the secondary wave so you have a change in shape you have a primary wave secretion and secondary wave so all of these phases have a role to play and every agonist combination or uh, alone is going to elicit the same trait so if you see in this chart there are two scenarios if that has been explained if you can see uh, this x axis is the optical density and the y axis is the time and if you see the blue blue tracer is the control tracer that we employ and this is the test after addition of the agonist in the patient so if you see the blue is all clear it's going well uh, you know you can see the tracer very easily but when you are using an adp you have a good tracer you when you are using an adrenaline it is fine you are using a collagen also it is giving that tracer that is required but when you are using a ristocetin there is no tracer at this point so so you can see that the graph has not moved from here so there is lack of agglutination with ristocetin so ristocetin if you remember it is required to have a link between what it does is it pushes the platelets uh, uh, towards the uh, the platelet glycoprotein 1b and von willebrand factor so it combines both so ristocetin is not showing that agglutination so obviously the defect can be either in 1b where it can be a bernard solier syndrome or it can be in a von willebrand factor which can point to von willebrand disease so whenever or it is showing a tracer or agglutination is been seen in all the other agonists except ristocetin it can be either von willebrand disease or bernard solier syndrome now in the second phase if you see all the agonists are not showing agglutination except in some agglutination in ristocetin this is the exact opposite of bernard solier syndrome in which uh, disease does this happen it happens in glanzman thrombasthenia or afibrinogenemia that is defect in 2b3a or glycoprotein 2b3a uh, defect so how do you prove it you go for a flow cytometry like i said and in that you can see that flow cytometry will tell you whether it is bernard solier and you can, of course you have screened it but you need to establish it and that is why fly flow cytometry using the various uh, um, uh, cd markers you can actually you know find out whether it is glanzman thrombasthenia or bernard solier syndrome so another scenario in which you can see that the first wave aggregation is seen you can see that here first wave and after that suddenly it goes off whereas same thing is happening with adrenaline and collagen and only a partial agglutination happens with the ristocetin so what this graph essentially tells you is that after the primary wave there is no secondary wave which is happening so basically there is defect in the release of the nucleotide or the release of the granules and this is consistent with either platelet storage or pool disorder or a defect in a nucleotide release so it's self evident so whenever you have just primary wave no secondary wave obviously the secretions have not been released obviously if secretions are not 
release, there is no thromboxin A2, there is no ADP. And when ADP is not there, it is a whistleblower. It's not going to give you the other platelets for uh, causing aggregation. So just to elaborate, uh, you know, representation of all the platelet function defect and how it is going to behave with various kind of agonists, whether it is ADP, adrenaline, collagen, arachidonic acid, thrombin, or ristocytin induced platelet aggregation. So you can divide the platelet function disorder based on the aggregometry test. Basically, what you do is upfront, you start with an ADP, collagen, and ristocytin. And depending on whether there is a primary aggregation absent or there is a secondary aggregation uh, response that is absent, you can actually divide them into thrombosthenia, that is Glanzmann thrombosthenia, established by glycoprotein 2B3A measurement in flow cytometry. So you have to go for a final test, that is flow cytometry. And then when you have a sec absent secondary aggregation response, obviously you need to further divide it. So you go for a uh, arachidonic acid uh, path, uh, you know, aggregation response. And if it is normal, obviously the granule content has to be measured. Uh, if it is abnormal, you go for a endoperoxide analog and you will see if uh, there is normal, it could be a COX uh, deficiency or if it is abnormal, it can be the granule contact and that you need to uh, further differentiate. However, if there is a normal aggregation response to ADP, collagen, but only absent to ristocytin, you go for a von Willebrand assay that obviously points to Bernard's folio or von Willebrand disease. So if you look for a von Willebrand factor assay, if it is abnormal, it is von Willebrand disease. If it is normal, it is a Bernard's folio syndrome. So this is how you divide the various platelet function defect according to the platelet aggregometry. Now, the second platelet function test that we need to know is the platelet function analyzer. It is a PFA 100 or 200, which is a global test of platelet function. Very uh, handy test. It is It uses the citrate whole blood. It is a rapid test, point of care test, and measures the platelet plug formation under high shear stress. So this is simulates the body where we have high shear rates, especially in the arteries. And you can see that unlike the platelet aggregometry, which does not cover this shear rate, uh, this is a better test uh, in that way. It has got very high negative predictive value. So that is a very important test. So what happens is the whole blood is introduced into this cartridge. If you see it is going like this and the cartridge is coated with either epinephrine and collagen or ADP and collagen. And essentially what happens is the whole blood when it goes from air, there is an occlusion, there is a platelet drug formation and the time taken for the uh, trigger, adhesion, activation and aggregation and thereafter closure of aperture is noted. Advantage of platelet function analyzer include only small volume of citrate venous blood and non-skin person can also use uh, it is and it has got a very high negative predictive value and it is relatively insensitive to the clot factor deficiency which may cause a problem. The other test that I was already discussing which uh, depends on the flow cytometer if you have it and you can operate it it is a flow cytometry test which is uh, used for a, uh, specific settings and like monitoring of gp 2b 3a uh, antagonist therapy and basically it involves a hydrodynamic fo focusing of this uh, you know this uh, uh, cells that are passing through the aperture and uh, this is how it's going and it is actually, you know, the light or the laser is being pointed towards it. And this is how you can discover the uh, uh, flow cytometry. So coming to how it looks like, you can see that we have used the two antibodies, CD41 and CD61. So you can see everything is in place. We give forward scatter. And then when you actually get it against CD41 and CD61 and here against CD42, B and CD61, this is a normal platelet. You can see that. CD41 and 61 and here CD42B and CD61. So in CD41 and CD61 is basically C, uh, 2B and 3A and this is for uh, 42B is actually for uh, glycoprotein 1B. So here in Bernard Solier syndrome if you see 41 and 61 is okay but if you see a 42B which is uh, and you get it with 61 you can see that this is missing so if you see on the other slide if you see cd41 cd61 both are missing so basically it is a glycoprotein 2b3a complex there is no if you have gated air you can see that there is no no cells present in this side of the thing so the, obviously glansman thrombosthenia is what it is pointing at 
Now thromboelastography or ROTEM is a point of care test. We are all aware of it. It basically means that it gives you a in vitro assessment of global coagulation in the whole blood from beginning of clot formation to the fibrinolysis. It's like a, a point of care test, viscoelastic assay, very handy in special situations like uh, obstetric, gynae, uh, massive hemorrhage in liver transplants and uh, other bleeding disorders where we have uh, coagulopathy and uh, uh, other things uh, going together. So it measures the viscoelastic property of the whole blood and basically what happens is we have a cup and a pin and uh, we have a whole blood which is going to clot and uh, as the uh, so it, one of them is rotating depending upon whether it's tag or rotem. So uh, so basically if your cup is moving it is uh, the uh, tag but if your pin is moving it is rotem. So depending upon what you have in your institute you can uh, both are equally important equally you know giving that information that you want and it rotates at an angle of 4 to 45 degree and as the clot forms the obviously the 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 pin also starts moving with the cup and that gives you a tracer like we have a tracer in the agrigometry so this is how the tracer looks like it gives you a, a full uh, uh, life cycle of the clot basically starting from the coagulation to the fibrinolysis so you can see that there is the r or the clotting time there is a k or alpha which gives you clot kinetics and then you have the maximum amplitude which is going to uh, talk about platelets and then finally the lysis 30 which is going to tell you about fibrinolysis so there is another uh, 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 in fact episode on tag which you can always refer to we have already covered tag so i'm not going to repeat that again but what tag uh, why tag is important in platelet function test is because now we have unique instruments which have clubbed the platelet aggregometry along with the thromboelastography so you can have both the windows where one window is showing you related aggregations and also the uh, the the whole uh, tag uh, tracer so that will give you a, a good clue as to what is the platelet function defect along with uh, the the actual uh, clot formation so this i've already covered so there are algorithms for platelet function uh, defect testing i'm not going to uh, you know talk about these but these are very essential and sometimes you can take help of this after you have done the initial evaluation this is there for your reference you can always take this there are many in fact platelet function defect testing uh, algorithms that are available this is the one that we employ here and similarly you can have platelet function disorders based on what kind of a uh, uh, abnormality you are detecting in your smear after you have got a thrombocytopenia so basically you have a large platelets or a, a small platelets how your platelet aggregation tests are you can use this algorithm as well so now coming to why they are over theorized and why it is under practice so so platelet function test yes it is uh, under practice why because many a times in spite of having these three indications they are not indicated to evaluate the abnormal platelet morphology. So whenever there is a platelet morphology that is, uh, you know, abnormal, we do not go for a platelet function upfront. So we always review and manual platelet count assessment is done. Sometimes it may, of course, give you a clue to a platelet function defects and many a time a platelet morphology may be anyways a little effective. So platelet function testing is also not appropriate as a means of monitoring antiplatelet drugs or predicting bleeding in patients with thrombocytopenia. So it is not helpful there. Then there are a lot of caveats with the testing. You, you may be using medications. You can may be using antiplatelet drugs. I've already spoken about the thrombocytopenia wherein the platelet count if less than 80,000, we do not go for an aggregometry test. Then a lot of coagulation abnormalities or clotting abnormalities may also interfere with the interpretation. Now, all said and done, sample is a very important part in platelet function test. How you are taking the sample, whether the tunic is very tight, you are taking fresh on your own sample. All of this will have a bearing. Even the needle, the, the gauge or the needle size is going to have a bearing. So if you have a needle size should be 21 gauge or larger. So any sample which is hemolyzed, clotted or incompletely filled to should be rejected. Excessive agitation of the sample should be avoided and the sample should be maintained at room temperature and transported to the specialty testing laboratory without delay. Now, agrigometry itself has a, a lot of caveats. I have already spoken about thrombocytopenia. It is very labor intensive and requires careful quality control and a fair degree of technical expertise. Uh, the test is not available everywhere, generally a corporate hospital or a Corporate, uh, or a laboratory which is catering to a lot of patients would have a platelet function defect 
because you have to utilize whatever your agents you have and it is not sensitive to all dense granule or the storage pool disorders and release defects so sometimes even when you are doing aggregometry many a times you will have the uh, uh, problems like inconclusive results which are not going to point to anything so so like i said it can be a normal tracer you can have mild abnormality which is not going to take you anywhere you may have inconsistent aggregometry and flow cytometry result or when you're very lucky you may have a specific molecular defect so present state of platelet function test it is in progress it is improving we have point of care testing like platelet function defects which are using not only uh, whole blood tests such as the mea or platelet mapping with rotem device or a tech device but these point of care tests like pf your platelet function analyzer 100 or 200 is going to help us in establish a di diagnosis and especially in cardiac cases or when you are monitoring antiplatelet drugs so that's where it is gaining its importance and the more we strive and more we understand it, then only we can help the patient in platelet function test. So does platelet function test have a role to play still? Yes, of course. It has a wide role in uh, the inherited platelet function disorders. It should be ordered by a trained hematologist and performed and integrated by a trained lab personnel who knows when to order, which test to order, and should know the caveats of each test in general platelet function test. So please understand platelet hemostasis is complex. PFT should help in patient diagnosis in many on most uh, inherited platelet function disorder and this EOC or the point of care platelet function test have opened a new realm of platelet management in certain condition like cardiac cases and in patients on antiplatelet drugs. So thank you so much. If there is any query or anything you want to ask about platelet function test or anything you want us to elaborate upon, we will be happy to do it and hopefully this uh, episode was helpful to you and uh, never stop learning we are there for thank you so much